Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the civil service examination's perspective. So today, we are going to discuss the Hindu Delhi edition dated 9th June 2023. The important topics which are to be discussed have been displayed on your screen and a timestamping of the same has been provided in the description box below. So now, let us begin our today's session. So first of all, there is an important announcement for all of you. Rouse IAS has launched 10 series for the Political Science and International Relations optional subject. There will be 8 tests in the test series and you will get a timely and detailed evaluation of your attempt. This whole program is going to be under the mentorship of Mr. Rahul Puri sir. You will get personal attention and can discuss your queries and doubts with the Rouse IAS teachers. There is a link in the description which has more details so you can join the program and boost your preparation for the mains exam. The second announcement is in relation to the mains revision classes. Rouse IAS will be conducting mains revision classes for 2023 mains exam. Many of you would be aware of the fact that these classes have boosted the performance of many top rankers in the past like Anandya Rashi, Namrata Chobe and Pooja Jha and helped them to score ranks in top 100. So, what will be the features of this program? First, there will be around 150 hours of live online classes which will help you in revising all the important themes of all subjects in question-answer discussion mode. Two, there will be unlimited one-to-one -one mentorship from teachers of Rao's IAS. Three, there will be a test series which will simulate the exam-like experience multiple times before you take the actual exam. Plus, timely and detailed feedback will help you to write your best answers. Four, you will also get all the notes from the teacher's classes to help you revise all the topics. There will be four hours of classes every day from Monday to Friday. Respected teachers like Mr. Baswa Open, Fezan Khan, Arun Bhardwaj, I, Gaurav Tripathi, Shashank, Vaibhav Mishra sir, Mr. Rankit Kaul and Mr. Jatin Bhardwaj are looking forward to help you get top ranks once more in 2023. So enroll for the course and boost your chances to score your best. There is a link in the description and you can know more by clicking on that. So this is our first topic, Cyclone's effect on monsoon onset. This topic has appeared at the text and the context page in today's The Hindu Delhi edition. And broadly this topic talks about the impacts of tropical cyclones and its interaction with the onset of monsoon in India. This is the very context of this article. As we know that Arabian Sea is witnessing a cyclone formation which is known as Bipar Joy and IMD has said that it is impacting the onset of monsoon in India. However, the question is that is there a only tropical cyclone in the Arabian Sea that is Bipar Joy which we know and it is impacting the monsoon of monset? No, there are other tropical cyclones also. So that is why in today's session we are going to learn the Tropical Cyclones Interaction with the Monsoon As far as the UPSC scheme of syllabus is concerned, this topic falls under the purview of General Studies Mains Paper 1 in the Geography section as it mentions a subtopic changes in critical geographical features including the water bodies and ice caps and the effect of such changes. So this is a very lengthy topic and therefore we have to do these topics in two parts. The first part deals with understanding the concept of monsoon, how is it generated and what do we exactly mean by onset of monsoon, how this onset of monsoon is affected by various parameters and how the monsoon is distributed across India in the temporal span. So to understand this very aspect, I would request you to go back to my previous DNS dated June 1st, 2023 whereby we have discussed two things in very detail. The first is the onset as well as the retreat of monsoon and the second is the recent changes in the monsoonal pattern because of the climate change. So there we have discussed these things. In today's session what we are going to learn is that how the tropical cyclones are interacting in the present context with the onset or the arrival of the monsoon and these tropical cyclones are not restricted to the Indian Ocean but some of the cyclones are also from the Pacific Ocean. So we are going to learn about the aspects which are mentioned in today's news article. So let us assume that this is the rough map of the Indian Ocean obviously showing India. Let us assume that this is the rough equator 
zero degree passing through the Africa and then to the Southeast Asia. We all know that this is the Indian Ocean and this is the Pacific Ocean. Now, first of all, what we need to understand is that Indian monsoon is inter-hemispheric phenomena that is the forces or the factors are interacting from both the hemisphere that is the northern hemisphere as well as the southern hemisphere also inter-oceanic phenomena because the winds the factors again are interacting not just from the indian ocean but also from the pacific ocean as well as from the atlantic ocean also so and this is the very reason behind the higher complexities of the Indian monsoon because so much of factors so much of regional and global factors interact with each other and that is why the Indian monsoon and its study becomes very complex so it becomes very easy to say that IMD is not able to predict the exact time but still in most of the occasions IMD is correct and that too when it is to analyze all the factors which are occurring not only in the Indian Ocean but also in the Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Arctic area, Antarctic area, upper atmospheric circulation. So just imagine the task which our IMD body does. Right? So now let us see that what is happening, how the tropical cyclones are interacting. First is the Bipar Joy circulations. Now let us imagine that Bipar Joy cyclonic formation is there in the Arabian Sea, we know this. Now here there are two ways that how this cyclone can move and depending upon the movement or the direction of the tropical cyclone we can say that whether it is going to increase the monsoonal intensity or reduce the monsoonal intensity generally we cannot say anything but yes we have to see so by basic knowledge we know that tropical cyclones are the low pressure region which means that this is also a low pressure region which means it is attracting the wind from the Arabian Sea towards this area right now there are two possibilities one possibility is that it moves towards the Indian West Coast second possibility is that it moves towards the Oman or Yemen coast now if let us say that this cyclone is moving towards the Indian West Coast which means the low pressure region is shifting towards India which in turn means all the winds from the Arabian Sea will be moving towards India and that is why it may lead to increase in the monsoonal intensity that is we can say that it will be better for India. On the other hand let us imagine that this cyclone is moving towards Oman or the Yemen coast so all the winds now will be deflected towards Oman or Yemen all the moisture which was accumulated over this particular region will be deflected over Oman or Yemen. So now India will be having a deficit rainfall. So this is how the cyclone Bipa Joy can have an impact over the Indian monsoon. Okay. However, IMD says that as far as now is concerned, Bipa Joy is not interacting mainly with the Indian monsoon. There are other cyclonic formations and that too not in the Indian Ocean but in the Pacific Ocean which are greatly influencing the India's monsoon leading to its delayed arrival. So now let us see that which are those cyclonic formations. There are two cyclonic formations. One was in the month of May near this particular area. So this cyclone was named as Mavar. And presently, we have a circulation that is low pressure circulation in the east of Philippines. Let us imagine this area and this cyclone is known as Guchol. So this was Mawar and this is Guchol. Now these were very intense tropical cyclones which will mean that it was a very low pressure region. This and this. So to understand the concept, let us imagine simply that there is a very high intensity low pressure region over the northwest pacific ocean region so let us say that this complete region is affected by high intensity low right now what will happen we all understand the basics of monsoon that as there is an apparent shift of the solar insulation towards the tropic of cancer there is a change and there is a shift 
in the position of the intertropical convergence zone that is ITCZ which moves towards the northern hemisphere. As it moves towards the northern hemisphere and as soon as there is a withdrawal of the subtropical jet streams, the winds after crossing the equator move towards India and this is known as the southwest monsoonal winds, right? We know this. So why these winds are being attracted towards India? Because now India being the continental landmass, it is heated and that is why I experience very high intensity low pressure region. Also, there are impacts of the jet streams, their withdrawal creates intensive low pressure region and all these factors come in play. Now we have to discuss that how the low pressure that is the cyclonic formations over the northwest pacific affected. So it is very simple. We know that winds move from high to low pressure. So it will depend that which region was experiencing higher low pressure region. If this was an intense low pressure region because of the formation of these cyclones, so all the winds which were to get diverted towards India will now be get diverted in this particular fashion, right? So all the winds will move towards like this and it will not enter into India. The winds are moving from Indian Ocean towards the Southeast Asian continent and then towards the Northwest Pacific because here the cyclone Mavar and the cyclone Guchol wants these winds, wants these moisture. As soon as the winds and moisture move towards this particular region, India will not get those winds and moisture and hence it can affect the onset of the monsoon. So this is the first factor that the low pressure formations over northwest pacific can lead to delayed onset. In this line the second important factor is the difficult movement of the monsoon trough. Now we shall understand that what is monsoon trough and how its difficult movement affects the onset of monsoon. Okay, so this first point is clear. So now let us discuss the another concept. So again, let me draw a rough map of Indian Ocean. This is Africa. This is West Asian region. Here comes India. And then this is a Southeast Asian region. This is Indonesian Philippine Islands. Here we have Australia and this we have Kamchatka Peninsula. So let us again imagine that this is an Indian Ocean. So such type of rough maps help us to better understand the concepts related to physical geography. First, now what do you mean by monsoon trough? So you can simply understand this concept by imagining that monsoon trough is nothing but just a low pressure region which generally gets developed over the Gangatic Plains. Okay, so during summers because there is a higher heating of the Gangatic Plains, so a low pressure region gets developed over here. You can also understand this monsoon trough by understanding the concept of shifting of ITCZ because we know that during the months of summer, the ITCZ when it moves northwards and it gets collected over the Gangatic Plains. So this is basically the monsoon trough. If you have to learn about monsoon trough in detail, then just go to the IS Compass website whereby we have discussed that how the location of monsoon trough affects the onset of monsoon. Here we are restricting our discussion to understand the relation between the movement of monsoon trough, tropical cyclone formation as well as the onset of monsoon. So in the earlier map we discussed that here we were having a low pressure region and monsoon trough by basic understanding we know as soon as the ITCZ will move towards north we will be having the monsoon trough get developed over here. So now let us imagine that what is the wind circulation. The winds are moving like this. Fast blowing winds are moving from Indian Ocean collecting all the moisture towards the northwest pacific region because here we have a low pressure cyclone formation which wants winds as well as moisture. And in this fast moving wind we have the intertropical convergence zone which is trying to move towards India. Okay, but now the dominant winds because it is moving in this direction, it is not allowing the monsoon trough or the ITCZ to shift towards the north. So, so that is why in today's article a very interesting analogy has been taken. The author says you just imagine that 
दिस इज अ हाईवे वेयर बाय अ वेरी हाई स्पीड ट्रैफिक इज मूविंग फ्रॉम इंडियन ओशन टूवर्ड्स द पैसिफिक ओशन एंड देन देयर इज अ स्मॉल कार विच हैज टू क्रॉस दिस हाईवे इन दिस पर्टिकुलर डायरेक्शन सो इट विल ऑब्वियसली बिकम वेरी डिफिकल्ट एंड दैट इज वाई and that is why under dominance of these fast moving winds the it cz will not be able to move towards india again delaying the onset of the monsoon so that is why two factors one the low pressure formations over the northwest pacific attracting the winds and moisture and second difficult movement of the monsoon trough these two important factors are taken in this article so in today's session we have discussed this thing in very detail by understanding the concepts and understanding that how tropical cyclones interact with the wind systems over the indian as well as pacific ocean and how it in turn affects the onset of monsoon we took the examples of three cyclones one the bipar joy second was mawar cyclone and next was the gucho cyclone now here last question which might come into your mind is we generally say that cyclones in the indian ocean occur in either the pre monsoon period or the post monsoon period why because during the monsoonal period the wind shear is very high okay because high velocity winds are moving and different layers have different velocities so during monsoon there is a very high wind shear and for tropical cyclones to form we require a low wind shear and that is why not during the monsoon but the pre and the post monsoon seasons are most favorable for cyclone formations in india but now when we take example of bipar joy cyclone it might come to your mind that now we are into the monsoon season and how then come this cyclonic formation is taking place during the monsoon the answer lies in climate change and also the local factors so because of the climate change there is a higher arctic melting because of the higher arctic melting the temperature of the arabian sea is also increasing the study suggests that temperature of the arabian sea as well as the bay of bengal in last few years on an average has increased by 1 degree celsius right so because of this climate change the tropical cyclones are also changing their patterns they are increasing their frequency as well as intensity and also when we talk about the monsoon season it is a four month season so we cannot say that this bipar joy is formed well between the monsoonal season it is just the transitional period just the start of the monsoonal season and obviously in climatology the local factors play its role and the general trend may not be followed many times also imd says that this is a late pre monsoonal cyclone so still it is a pre monsoonal but obviously in a relatively later period so these were the things and the concepts which i need to discuss from the today's news article and from the upsc syllabus of changes in the critical geographical features obviously we have here discussed two important features one is the monsoon and other is the tropical cyclones this article has appeared at page number 9 in today's the hindu daily edition and the topic is in relation to the production linked incentives that is pli scheme this scheme has appeared in newspapers in the present times multiple times and basically as far as the upsc scheme of syllabus is concerned this topic is mainly important for the general studies mains paper 3 section in the economy part the topic reads do production linked incentives for manufacturing work so as the topic is very clear to you in this session we are going to discuss the dimension associated with the pli scheme basically what do you mean by pli what is the significance that is merits what are the challenges or the demerits or the potential issues and what can be a way ahead so that is why first we should understand that what exactly do we mean by pli pli basically stands for the production linked incentives so if you break this term you will get to understand the basic objective of this particular scheme it is saying that the incentives is linked to the production so for example i was having a manufacturing unit and let's say i was producing 100 units per year of 
let's say watches now if i am able to increase this production to let's say 200 units so because i have increased 100 units so now the incentives will be given to me on the basis of this increased production so this is basically the production linked incentive scheme for some products it is based on the actual sales for some products it is based on the incremental sales similarly there are different sectors for which this pli scheme has been given and the incentives ranges from 1 to 20% for example when it comes to certain electronic products then the incentive is around 1% similarly when it comes to drugs the incentive ranges up to 20% so it varies that means it is not one size fits all approach so in this very sense if we have to analyze that what are the chief characteristics of the pli that is production linked incentive scheme we can say that first it is an outcome oriented scheme because if the unit production was increasing only then i was getting the incentive so it is based on the outcomes second it takes the local value addition into account third it focuses on size and the scale for example the chief industries of the products which this particular scheme has taken is mainly determined the voluminous production so basically the sectors which can grow which can increase and play on the economy of scale this pli scheme is focusing on those things for example the sectors which are technologically intensive or the sectors which are focusing on the rural development because there we have a very high potential similarly the sectors which are having a higher potential to create the jobs for example electronics industries and similarly the industries or the sectors which have very high export potential also so these are certain sectors within the pli scheme further this is also wto compliant in this very land we should understand that what are various significance of the fpi first and the foremost significance is that because this scheme is government supported that means government is trying to provide incentives to various manufacturers or producers and because this support is been given by the government this can increase the global investment in india because it can attract the investors as it is also increasing the profit margins of the investors and that is why it will further incentivize the global investors to shift their production bases towards india we already know that many of the manufacturing production bases are being shifted from europe towards the asian region but even in the asia we face stiff competition from countries especially like china and some of the southeast asian economies so in this very sense in order to tackle this competition in order to overcome this competition from china and other southeast asian economies india should come up with such schemes in order to woo the investors second is it will also boost the production which in turn will meet the demand that is external demand as well as the domestic demand we all know that the market is continuously increasing for such products like watches smartphones laptops etc so in order to tap the increasing potential of the demand of the market this scheme can increase the supply side by boosting the production further it can also create a huge employment because obviously it is increasing the industrial production it is increasing the profit margin so obviously it can also increase the market potential and further last it has a special focus on the digital economy and that is why this pli scheme can further increase the digital potential of our country all these benefits eventually will lead to positive outcomes like increase in gdp increase in per capita income increase in competitiveness further it can also provide the geopolitical advantages also we all know that today is the era of economic warfare so the country who is having strong economic credentials that country will also govern the overall policies so these are certain significances of the pli but then there are certain potential challenges also 
first and the foremost challenge is that there is an absence of the common parameters just now we read and understood that this scheme basically is focusing on the incremental production plus local value addition now the question arises that for different industries for different products this scheme does not define any common parameter to let's say measure the value addition so for different industries different parameters are taken which increases the vagueness and subjectivity second is steep targets in order to avail the incentives which are given by the government there are very high targets which are to be met for example last year out of the 14 industries which registered themselves for this scheme in the electronic sector only two to three industries could get those incentives because only these industries could meet those targets so most of the industries most of the players got excluded from this scheme the third issue is that because the scheme is dealing with multitudes of different industries and therefore sector specific incentives must be there but then the question is that how to determine the incentives for each of those industries let's say if we are taking 14 industries or 15 industries so how will we determine that what type of incentive must be given to which type of industry on which type of product so there is a lot of heterogeneity in it and this is also a potential issue next we all know that this is a government interference so believers of the free market economy criticize this scheme that government is involved over here and which in turn in longer run can hamper the domestic industries because then whenever we provide certain incentives to any player those players become actually dependent and they forget to grow on their own so this is a government interference in the free market economy and last but not the least it is it can also acts as a disadvantage for the other sectors we have discussed that under the pli scheme only certain sectors are taken not every sector so what about the other sectors which are not included in the scheme so this scheme basically discriminates against the other sectors so these are certain challenges associated with the pli scheme in this very line we should also understand that what can be a way forward the first and the foremost thing is that the government can come up with the pre defined sunset clause basically under the existing pli scheme there is no time limit so we do not know that up to what time period 2 years 5 years 10 years the scheme is working and that is why it may create the dependence of various players as we have discussed so in order to reduce this dependence the government must come up with certain predefined sunset clause that let's say after 10 years or after 5 years this scheme will not be there so that various manufacturers or producers or industrialists they are clear in their mind that this scheme is only for certain time period and it is not permanent second we must focus on increasing the technological competence as well as the business environment because these things can increase the indian manufacturing in the long run yes obviously we need to provide short term support also and that is why we are giving the pli schemes and various other schemes but in the longer run we must focus on the root causes that why india is lagging in manufacturing technological competence and business environment focuses on that aspect next is the regular scheme review so just launching the scheme is not important equally important is continuous reviewal of those schemes and taking the corrective measures and last is focusing on research and development as well as skill development all these things must be taken in consonance in order to increase the overall manufacturing ecosystem in india so that was all about this particular topic in this topic we have discussed that what do we exactly mean by pli we discussed the significance of the pli challenges as well as the way forward now this topic is from the international relations section the topic is in the context of the atlantic declaration recently signed between us and uk and same is the immediate context of this article 
United States and Britain have announced a new strategic pact as their leaders rededicated the special relationship to counter Russia, China and economic instability. So basically this Atlantic Declaration deals with this strategic pact. It is a holistic declaration covering multiple areas of bilateral collaboration. So in this relation, this topic is mainly important from the prelims perspective. However, you can use this as an example in your mains answers also. So let us see certain key facts related to the Atlantic Declaration. It aims to boost the industry ties on defense as well as renewable energy between US and UK. So it is also seen as a follow-up of the Atlantic Charter which was signed in 1941. This declaration, that is Atlantic Declaration, includes the commitments on easing the trade barriers, closer defense industry ties and data protection deal in order to strengthen the cooperation of artificial intelligence. So basically, this Atlantic Declaration does not only have the security aspects, but it also has the economic as well as technological aspects. For example, it says expansion of subsidies with the proposals to remove the barriers which affected the trade in electric vehicle industry. So basically, the removal of the trade barrier is also its important component. Similarly, partnership in the sphere of critical minerals. Similarly, data partnership which can allow the UK firms to transfer the data freely to the certified US organizations without paying a levy. Again, because this topic is mainly important from the Prince perspective, so you should be aware that one, Atlantic Declaration is signed between which two countries, US and UK. Second, it is dealing with multiple components, for example, security, economy, technology, AI, trade, data, and also the regional geostrategic strategies, for example, focusing on the Euro-Atlantic as well as Indo-Pacific region. And therefore, it has aimed to create an Indo-Pacific dialogue also. And it says that through the US-UK Indo-Pacific dialogue, leaders agreed to continue, find new opportunities to coordinate the approaches and to support the ASEAN countries. Further, under this Atlantic Declaration, both of these countries have reaffirmed their faith in NATO. So these were certain factual details in relation to the Atlantic Declaration from the prelims perspective. This topic again has appeared at the text and the context page and is in relation to the UPI transactions. The immediate context of this very news article is that recently the UPI related frauds have been on the rise. In this very regard, various leading banks including HDFC, SBI, XS, ICICI, etc have implemented some restrictions on the UPI transactions. And also, NPCI, that is National Payments Corporation of India, has set certain guidelines to regulate the expanding digital payment ecosystem. So basically, because of the increase in the financial frauds, such restrictions have come into account. So in this very regard, it is important for us to understand and to learn certain key facts related to the UPI. For example, the UPI as well as Aadhaar enabled payment system are very much in news. So today we are dealing with the key facts related to the UPI. And we all are using the UPI, so obviously it will be very easy for us to understand these things. First of all, UPI is an instant real-time payment system. Obviously correct because with the help of UPI, we are able to send the monies to anyone within the real time. This system is developed by the National Payment Corporation of India, that is NPCI. And another important feature is that this whole system is basically built over the IMPS, that is Immediate Payment Service Infrastructure. So this key terminology is very important, that is Immediate Payment Service. Important features. First, we know that the payments can be made round the clock in real time. Second, it eliminates the risk of sharing the bank account details by the remitter as customers are not required to enter the details such as card number, account number, IFSC, etc. And it supports both the modes of payment that is person to person 
and person to merchant payments so that is why it is enabling both the types of transactions and enables the users to send as well as to receive the money it enables the use of single mobile application for accessing different bank accounts and because of this very feature the UPI mode of transaction has become so common the transactions are carried out through mobile devices with two factor authentication or again an important fact two factor authentication using the device binding and a UPI pin as a security further it also says that registration of beneficiary is not required for transferring the funds to the UPI as the fund would be transferred based on using a virtual payment address created by the customer so these are the key facts related to UPI However, today's article is focused on the limits which are set by various banks and we have discussed that this is set up in order to reduce the financial frauds. For example, let us assume that the limit earlier was rupees 1 lakh. So because now you can send rupees up to 1 lakh in one go, so there were higher chances of financial frauds. But let's say if I am reducing this limit of transaction in 24 hours, let's say, let us assume up to rupees 20,000, then the financial fraud in one day cannot exceed rupees 20,000. So in a way, I have saved 80,000. But yes, we do understand that this is again relatively a short term measure in order to increase the financial credibility of all these systems and to make them and insulate them from the financial frauds we need to invest in the technology we need to invest in the awareness generation of the customers and also we need to invest in the cyber security infrastructure of our country only these three steps can help us to find a long-term solution but yes Again, as it is said that not just the long term but short term solutions are equally important because we have to deal with the immediate problems also. So these were the key facts related to the UPI. Now coming to our last topic. The topic reads DRDO successfully tests the ballistic missile Agni Prime. And this is the immediate context of this news article that recently a new generation ballistic missile that is Agni Prime was successfully flight tested by DRDO from Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Islands of the coast of Odisha. So in this relation, in today's session, we will be dealing with certain important key facts related to all the Agni series missiles. So first we should have an overview that Agni series of missiles is a family of long range surface to surface ballistic missiles that can carry the nuclear bombs also obviously it is developed by drdo presently we have seven operational missiles in the agni series that is one two three four five and then we have agni prime and then agni six so let us deal with certain key facts agni one agni one is basically the shortest range and oldest missile in the agni family it is a two-stage solid fuel missile. Its range is 700 kilometers. Coming to Agni 2, we are dealing with the key facts for this. Agni 2, it is a medium range ballistic missile equipped with two solid fuel stages. Its range is far more than Agni 1. Its range is 2000 to 2500 kilometer. And they are said to be a component of the credible deterrence against China and Pakistan. Then we have Agni 3 ranging more 3500 km, two stage ballistic missile and can carry nuclear weapons. Agni 4 again increased range 400 km, two stage rocket engine powered by solid propellants. It is equipped with the state of the art avionics, accurate ring laser gyro based inertial navigation system, and lot of modern state of the art technology. Then comes the Agni 5. It is the first of its kind intercontinental ballistic missile of India. It has three stages. Important difference with the other missiles which we have discussed till now. Three stages, solid rocket powered missile system, 
capable of delivering 1.5 ton of nuclear warhead and range just see it exceeding 5000 km highest till now and that is why it is said that it can bring almost the entire Asia including the northernmost parts of China as well as some regions in Europe under its striking range. Here you can see the Agni 5 missile stage 1, stage 2 and then stage 3 and this is basically the range covering whole of the West Asia, Central Asia, parts of Europe, parts of Russia, whole of China etc. It also covers the Indian Ocean part. Then we have the Agni P. This is basically a new generation advanced variant of the Agni class missiles. Its range is between 1000 to 2000 km. So this is important. Here we have written Agni 5 after the Agni 4 and Agni 5. That does not mean its range is on a higher side. Its range is 1000 to 2000 km. But it is India's first declared MIRV multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles so re-entry vehicles again an important thing about the Agni Prime missiles it is 50% lighter than Agni 3 it may be launched from train and road and stored for an extended period now coming to the last that is Agni 6 again it is three stage solid fuel intercontinental blasting missiles it is still not developed but it is the early phases of development just see the range 8000 to 10000 kilometers again the highest range in the agni series is of agni 6 that is 8000 to 10000 kilometers so these were certain important key facts again from the prelims perspective in relation to the agni series of indian missiles so that was all for today all the very best and study hard.